health equity, social justice, health, um, and a number of clinical areas as well. Um, you have joined just uh, final verification, similar to what they do on flights and stuff. Uh, you all have boarded for um, federal and state collaboration around health-related social needs in Medicaid. Um, it's now or never, folks. So if you need to get up, now would be the opportunity. Um, I am thrilled to be joined by um, a number of colleagues from state and federal government who are tremendous partners in this work, um, both at the policy and the implementation level. Um, so what we'll do is let me just briefly introduce who we have on stage with us, and then um, uh, I'll come back for some framing remarks and we can kind of launch into the discussion. But in order from stage right to stage left, so to my um, immediate left, Dr. Gary Singh from Mass Health. Um, Shavana Howard from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Food and Nutrition Consumer Services. Um, Richard Cho from the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and J.C. Cooper from uh, the California Medicaid. Um, let me start by giving a bit of an overview on where we are with the coverage of health-related social needs in Medicaid and CHIP. Um, in the last few years have made tremendous headway in terms of, in particular, covering those services with um, federal match dollars. Um, there is a long history in the Medicaid program of recognizing the importance of upstream services like housing supports or nutrition supports. In particular, um, for, for those that are familiar with Medicaid, in particular in the home and community-based services waiver setting, um, what these new policies, both in managed care and um, Section 1115 demonstrations allow for, is the coverage of those services for really broader populations that are at clinical or social risk, in recognition of the fact that health-related social needs drive uh, as much, actually, if not more, than clinical care does in terms of an individual's health outcomes. Um, we have... Um, new flexibilities in Section 1115 demonstrations to cover those services inclusive of um, housing services such as short-term post-hospitalization housing, um, nutrition services like home-delivered meals or medically tailored meals, alongside case management services and care coordination services to really wrap. Um, as we were, um, oh, and then on the managed care side, um, through an authority called in lieu of services and supports um, that allows managed care plans to work with their enrollees to offer those services as substitutes for other Medicaid state plan services. Um, we are joined, as I said, by folks from the federal and state government who are really at the leading edge of that policymaking and of that partnership. Um, so without further ado, I will kick the first question to Gary. Um, and um, what I hope you will see over the course of this discussion, and we really do want it to be a discussion, so please be writing down your questions as we go, um, is um, there's a real intentionality to who is on stage here. Um, so both Gary and JC, being from Massachusetts and California respectively, are in states that, as I said, are really at the leading edge of taking up these policies. Um, and we'll have them speak to how they thought about scoping these services, how they thought about the different authorities that they could use and bring to bear, what it was like to get stakeholders on board and now in the early implementation phases of doing that work to, to benefit enrollees. Um, we also have Shivana and Richard here as federal partners from um, USDA and HUD respectively to speak to how the Medicaid piece is complementary to and kind of can wrap around or sit alongside the really important existing programs that HUD has, the really important existing programs that USDA and FNS has. Because I think um, if you hear me say nothing else in the context of this, it is that partnership and uh, really intentional collaboration and braiding and blending of funding, data sharing, right? Things that are really key enablers to actually making this work um, at a ground level and taking the policy really into practice. Um, so with that, Gary, first question for you. Um, can you tell us a bit about the Massachusetts experience, sort of how you 
thought about the set of services, share maybe a little for everyone what is in the 1115, what you all have been doing, um, and how that came to be, how you thought about scoping those services. Thank you. Um, so as Aditi mentioned, my name is Gary Singh. I'm the Senior Director of Strategic Initiatives at MassHealth. Um, and uh, we provide coverage for a little for a little less than a third of the of the state's uh, population. So um, to your question, uh, back in September of last year, CMS approved our most uh, our newest iteration of our 1115 waiver, which for those of you who don't know, is basically like a contract between our Medicaid agency and CMS on different ways, among other things, that we can implement new and innovative uh, approaches for administering a Medicaid program other than the standard way of doing so. And one of the most cutting edge aspects of it was being able to use Medicaid dollars and to, uh, to use those to pay for certain health-related social needs like housing supports and nutrition supports. Um, and though I, I tend to think about our uh, recent approval as authorizing phases three and four of our of our housing journey for the, the non-dual eligible uh, Medicaid population and phases two and three of our nutrition journey. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what all of those phases are. Um, and this gets to you know, what services we, uh, we have uh, approved and what populations uh, they're targeted towards. So on the housing side of things, uh, phase one uh, began in 2005 when we uh, began introducing uh, housing uh, benefits or supports uh, into our behavioral health uh, managed care structure. Uh, for individuals who are chronically homeless. And the services uh, were to help them look for housing, transition into housing, and then to receive uh, life skill coaching to stay in that housing once they uh, moved in. Um, and then uh, you know, over the next decade and a half or so, uh, we sort of progressively expanded uh, that behavioral health managed care benefit to more plans uh, within, the medic within the mass health uh, context. Phase two, uh, began in 2020 through something called our Flexible Services Program, uh, which was a pilot program also authorized under our 1115 waiver, uh, where uh, Medicaid Accountable Care Organizations, or ACOs, a, a particular kind of health plan, uh, could use those dollars to pay for a broader set of services for a broader population. Now, I do want to call it, uh, this was a pilot program, so it wasn't a, a benefit uh, like the Phase 1 services were, um, but uh, the Flexible Services Program um, allowed these ACOs to provide housing supports for folks uh, with needs other than behavioral health. So it could be physical health needs, uh, high ED utilization, uh, folks uh, with a need for support for activities of daily living, um, or experiencing a high-risk pregnancy. And uh, the, the services are, in addition to that, it wasn't just targeted to individuals who are chronically homeless, but could be, uh, it could meet other uh, levels or standards of homelessness as well as people who are at risk for homelessness. The services provided there, uh, again, through this sort of pilot uh, effort, uh, include you know, the same services as phase one services included, but also uh, eviction prevention services for those folks who are at risk for homelessness. Uh, and then also, uh, really importantly, we could start paying for goods. So what do I mean by goods? So let's say that someone's moving into an apartment. There's nothing in the apartment. So can we pay for things to furnish the place? Um, it, could, it could be used to pay for first and last month's rent, as an example, um, and could also be used to pay for things like home modifications or air conditioners uh, to help uh, folks with asthma, as an example. Um, phase three, which is uh, which was one of the phases that was authorized through uh, this most recent approval of, of our 1115 waiver, uh, expanded the number of services that were in the benefit. So in it. So previously, you know, phase one was focused on chronic homelessness uh, and the behavioral health managed care world. Uh, phase three expanded it beyond the managed care world. So now anyone at MassHealth who has a behavioral health need uh, could qualify for some of these uh, housing supports, regardless of their managed care, fee for service, et cetera. In addition to that, uh, we expanded the, the eligible population from the chronic homelessness uh, slice to also include uh, folks who were quote unquote just homeless but high utilizers of healthcare. And then we also added some eviction prevention services to the benefit as well. Phase four, uh, there's a lot of phases here, I recognize that, uh, is gonna begin in 2025. And this is when we take all of the services that I just described in the first three phases, we're gonna mash them together 
into a unified HRSN services framework where uh, we're, we will be uh, we'll be putting all of these things into the managed care uh, structure such that uh, we'll be needing to think through you know medical necessity criteria, provider qualifications, um, claims uh, adjudication, uh, rate setting, network adequacy. So the standard things that are part of a managed care uh, framework. Um, one of the wrinkles is that in this phase four world, uh, the we have a limited amount of funding or expenditure authority. So we're trying to figure out how do you implement in a managed care structure when you actually have a, a funding cap. Uh, so that's one. So that, that's one of the things we're, we're struggling with or thinking through on the housing side. On the nutrition side, um, phase one began in 2020 with the flexible services program. And so for there, we uh, we uh, again were able to uh, work with our ACOs to pay for. Uh, actual food goods, so medically tailored meals, uh, food prescriptions, uh, food vouchers, community uh, CSAs, um, and then in addition to that, uh, nutrition education and counseling uh, and kitchen supplies, as an example. Um, and then for both nutrition and housing, we were able to uh, provide transportation supports to actually access those housing and nutrition services. Phase two of our nutrition journey, uh, which again was authorized as part of this most recent 1115 waiver approval, uh, allows us to do something that was uh, the most requested thing that we heard about from stakeholders uh, in response to our phase one nutrition rollout, which is uh, being able to provide household level nutrition supports. As is sort of intuitive, if someone is hungry and they live in a household, they're going to share their food if they receive it. And so in some ways, you can think about that as diluting the nutritional intervention. So in phase two, beginning in April of this year, uh, ACLs will be able to use some of uh, their dollars to pay for uh, nutritional supports for uh, household members other than the actual individual Medicaid member. Um, and then phase three, we've already talked about beginning in 2025, we're going to uh, cram this in with uh, the other housing supports into this unified HRSN services framework. Um, I'll just touch briefly on the stakeholder piece, and then um, I'll, I'll uh, hand it over. Uh, this so this rollout of these multiple phases has definitely been a journey in Massachusetts, um, and we have been very intentional about trying to engage with the community, with our managed care plans, with our community-based organizations that are actually helping us to implement to provide these services. Um, and one example of that is we've procured uh, we, we have procured a uh, what we call a social services integration work group made up of all of the different players in the space. Uh, to help advise us on uh, policy design, design, implementation details, um, and, and those sorts of considerations. Um, and we're, as we begin to uh, prepare for this 2025 date, uh, we intend to procure a similar group to help us to think through some of those additional considerations. Uh, so we're really excited about the trajectory for both of the housing and the nutrition um, elements, um, and grateful to CMS and our, their federal partners for helping uh, to, to move us in, in that direction. Um, thank you, Gary. Shivani, tell us about, um, from USDA's perspective, maybe a, an overview of the nutrition security programs or, or the programs that would, for a similarly eligible population, be brought to bear, um, and an overview really of what, what FNCS is trying to do. Sure, thank you. And my name is Shavana Howard. I'm a senior advisor for USDA. I work um, very closely on SNAP. Um, I also have uh, over 20 years of state experience administering the SNAP program in the states of Louisiana and Washington State. And so, you know, for, for decades, uh, SNAP has been really working to fight poverty and hunger. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, and so we continue that fight of really trying to increase um, food and nutrition security as we have been doing for decades. And we do that through um, a plethora of programs. I know we often hear, or you often hear likely um, SNAP as the number one program within USDA, but there are actually 16 food programs within USDA, SNAP being the largest program that really responds to poverty and to hunger. Um, in SNAP, we serve about 42 million households um, on our program with 42% of them being seniors and 41% of them being children. Um, and then a lot of our population is honestly the, the working poor who is um, working, you know, jobs that are just at minimum wage and can't meet ends meet. Uh, within SNAP, like I said, there are a, a lot of programs, um, and I'll just touch on just kind of a few. 
um, although SNAP covers um, and touches so many individuals, there's one in four people who are actually eligible for SNAP that are actually on the program. So there is an access issue with individuals who really need, um, re really need that additional support, who are not getting those supports and those services. We also have our WIC program, which is really for um, pregnant women um, and children who really need additional nutrition support. And unfortunately, WIC is only reaching 50% of um, pregnant women who are actually eligible for the program as well. And not only are we only reaching 50%, but after the age of two, the participation on that program decreases drastically. And we lose a lot of children who really need those programs. You know, over the last several years, there's been some great intentional work that USDA has been doing with medical services as it pertains to WIC and to SNAP. I had the opportunity a few months ago to go to Colorado to see one of our sites, which is a co-location site, and we have them all throughout the state, um, in which staff are co-located within um, the medical fields and medical offices. I got to witness um, a mom who showed up for an appointment for pediatrics. It was like her daughter's three-month check-in. And while she was waiting for the doctor through some uh, USDA grants and funding that we had available, she was actually able, the nurse after she weighed her and got her all ready for the doctor to be seen, was actually able to page um, a WIC specialist who came in and did eligibility determination right on the spot. So the nurse who was checking in that mom had read in the notes that the doctor said that the, the, the child needed more, um, more milk, right? Um, additional supplements and services. And so did the mom as she was breastfeeding. And it was just beautiful to see that she didn't have to try to go navigate through this you know, convoluted process that we currently have in place, right? All these different federal programs to get services. And so we've really been focusing on increasing access. And what does that look like throughout the country? Because it looks very different. And it's through um, collaborations with um, physicians, with uh, insurance companies, um, partnerships with states who currently operate Medicaid programs, which most of our states, the majority, over 40 of the states operate as the same staff who operate SNAP and Medicaid in our states um, and who have great partnerships with, with WIC. And so they're able to do some intentional program alignment and try to do as much as we can when we talk about conferring eligibility or trying to reduce the administrative burden for individuals who are trying to apply for our programs and services because we recognize that's a huge challenge. And so we've done a lot of intentional partnerships um, intentional work on making sure that people are aware of the programs and that people have access to the programs. Uh, one of the areas that we've also been focusing on when we think of um, access is, you know, a lot of our populations live in areas that are rural. And so how are we ensuring that those rural populations are actually able to not only get the SNAP benefits, but actually be able to purchase food, right? Um, I can tell you in the state of Louisiana, um, I can go to any almost every parish within the state outside of New Orleans and Baton Rouge. And you will see that there is not a grocery store. Like some of them have a dollar general, right? So it is more or less, how are we able to really support and partner with um, those individuals who, needs, who need healthy resources? We took, um, prior to the pandemic, I think it was in 2019, we launched our SNAP online purchase, which some of you may have heard of, which is actually now in every state in one territory. And so individuals don't have to leave their home. They get incentive offers um, through ordering online, through um, Amazon, um, using Instacart, um, you know, their local grocery stores, um, so that they can actually purchase healthy, nutritious food and have it delivered to their home. Um, and partnering, a lot of states partnering with um, agencies like Instacart on making sure that they get their food, their healthier food options, the fruits and the vegetables delivered in, um, you know, within a certain hours of a window. Um, we also have programs like GUSNIP, um, which some of you may be familiar with, which is a food and uh, fruit and vegetable program that we have that is very much sometimes partners with our local farmers markets that we support throughout the state and in giving individuals opportunities to really have options to do match bucks or similar type of programs where we will match the SNAP dollars so that they can double up on what they can actually afford. And those work in states that are doing such great work already, especially with the 1115 waivers, as really just trying to give additional supports and resources for individuals who don't have enough food to eat. We all know that, you know, the average household, like I said, their benefit amount for, for one person is $281 a month. And it comes out to about $2 a meal or $6 a day, which is not a lot of money for individuals when they're trying to make nutrition decisions, especially if they live in a rural area 
where they go to a store and it costs six, seven dollars for a gallon of milk or a carton of eggs. And so it is really working really close with and understanding allowable waivers and flexibilities within the federal government so that states can operate programs and really tie together all of these programs to make really holistic services for individuals and families and to meet the needs. For, for years, we've, uh, USDA has also operated a SNAP nutrition and education program, which has really been focused on increasing um, healthy eating habits and physical activity. A lot of our programs, of course, are administered by state agencies, but most of them are, uh, are operated through a lot of uh, community-based organizations, right? So it's the community kind of knows best. Uh, we all know that a lot of people don't like to go to the federal government for help, but they will go to a community partner or friend to actually get res resources and support. And so it is a lot of work of making sure that there's resources and supports within the community so that individuals know how to cook certain meals, um, fruits, vegetables that they haven't um, particularly maybe have eaten before. Um, additionally, it's an increase that you'll see in the amount of support that's going um, on farming and on even on school gardens and school meals. Um, you know, you think of the child nutrition programs, just the school meals that are, you know, that we provide funding for on a daily basis for all children that are in school. And some of those schools have had the opportunity to partner with um, local farmers and actually do community gardens. Um, you know, using SNAP benefits to purchase seeds so that the people, so that individuals can actually grow their own fruits and their own vegetables. But then when they do that, how do they prepare those fruits and vegetables? And that's a lot of what SNAP nutrition education does is it really teaches individuals um, how to make uh, healthier choices, how to prepare some of those meals, um, and also how to shop on a budget because like I said, SNAP does not provide um, a lot of benefits or a lot of food assistance, definitely not everything that individuals need. Um, there's a lot of other programs that we are currently offering, a lot of intentional work that we're doing, especially around um, being creative on uh, innovative approaches in which we can really address um, or increase uh, food security within our country. And I think there's a lot of states that are actually leaning into those efforts on really trying to um, increase access and making it uh, making it less of an administrative burden and a process for individuals to access the food program just to have their basic needs met. So I think I will stop there. Thanks, Shivana. I, I wanna pick up on that theme of holistically supporting people. Um, and Richard, I think that's a really nice segue. If you could share with, um, if you could share with all of us a bit, similar to what Shivana just did around um, what HUD is trying to do in this space, sort of an overview of what HUD offers and how that integrates with this conversation here around serving Medicaid enrollees. I'm sure, happy to. Um, uh, so my name is Richard Cho. I'm, I'm the senior advisor for housing and services, and I work for the secretary um, of HUD. And um, let me tell you a little bit about the range of things HUD does. Um, you probably know about HUD in some specific ways, but we, we play a number of roles. And I think one of them is uh, we insure mortgages for homeowners as well as for people who are developing um, healthcare facilities and other other programs. Um, we also um, administer various forms of deeply affordable rental housing. That's either um, providing assistance directly to households so that they can rent apartments on the private market, or where we actually subsidize um, buildings or or subsets of buildings to keep the rents affordable in those buildings. We provide money to help communities to build more housing, um, or to redevelop neighborhoods and communities, uh, in particular in urban areas. Uh, and then, of course, we uh, play a major role in addressing the homelessness crisis um, and where we provide um, grants and other resources to help directly assist people who are um, experiencing homelessness and to some degree those that are at risk of homelessness. Um, for a number of the people that we touch, um, we know that uh, housing assistance is only part of what they need. And in fact, um, what they also need is wraparound supports, not only to stay in their homes, um, age in place and actually to be able to live independently, but many people actually uh, aren't even able to access our, our programs and obtain housing assistance because of their lack of supportive services. And so um, my position actually was created uh, during the Obama administration um, as a position within the office of the secretary and the entire charge that was given to the, the people in my role uh, and that I'm honored to currently serve in this role is to basically find ways to link with other federal agencies um, and other systems so that we can ensure that people pro are provided with the kind of supportive services, healthcare supports that they need so they can both access housing as well as um, stay in their housing. And so um, I think just 
uh, I've just been, uh, it's been a huge treat to be able to work with um, Aditi at, at CMS because uh, in many ways, I think um, the partnership that we have is a reflection of HUD's recognition that there are people out there who um, need a combination of housing and supports in order to fully succeed. Um, and so um, the focus on health-related social needs and housing as one of those is, is just really critical. Um, we also, we do fund um, some supportive services. In our homeless programs, for instance, we actually also um, provide some grants that pay for wraparound supports in, in as part of housing programs or, or even independently. But it's, all, it's all ultimately a, a really tiny portion of our, our spending and our budget. We also fund service coordinators um, who work within our older adult um, housing or housing for seniors. Um, and their job is Herculean. It's basically a one person in a building who's often trying to chase down a number of different healthcare um, interventions for older adults so they could prevent falls, so they could help people um, with medication management, um, essentially to prevent them from um, institutional care. But in many ways, we're often um, paying for a really tiny portion of the kind of services that people need and um, putting the onus on um, you know, case managers and service coordinators to have to chase down um, the much bigger kind of healthcare supports that we need. And so um, a different way that we're approaching that is um, by trying to find and leverage um, partnerships um, with other sectors and services. I think the place where we've done that the best um, is in our, uh, a program that we have for homeless veterans known as the HUD VA Supportive Housing Program. And uh, I think um, once in a while, Congress does something really smart, which is uh, to create a program where they're giving money to HUD to pay for rental assistance for veterans who are homeless, to transition them to permanent housing, and also appropriating money at the Department of Veteran Affairs to provide case management services um, for, for homeless veterans. So it comes as a package um, funding to two different federal agencies, uh, and essentially a, a veteran who gets HUD bash um, assistance gets a, a rental voucher, they can move into a private apartment, and they get a dedicated case manager that is plugged into the entire a VA uh, healthcare system and network. Um, and I think in some ways that's the kind of gold star Cadillac example of how we can pair housing and services. Now, um, people often ask us, why don't you do HUD bash for other people who are homeless or basically like any other population that needs housing and services? And we were like, we'd be, we would love to be able to do that if Congress was to find a way to do that. But as we know, there's not a sort of government run integrated healthcare system for the majority of Americans, particularly those that are low income. So we have to work within uh, the, the, uh, the, the systems that exist. And I think the biggest opportunity is within, within Medicaid. Uh, and so when I hear about examples like Massachusetts and, about, and California, where uh, the, the Medicaid agencies are recognizing that if they can have Medicaid cover the kind of wraparound supports that people need to move into housing and to stay into housing, and that's paired with housing assistance that's provided by HUD or perhaps a state agency, that, that's essentially how we get to that combination of housing and, and services. And so um, for us, uh, and particularly my role is figuring out how do we work closely with CMS and other partners and, and support states in aligning um, what can be done under your Medicaid programs to cover those um, housing related wraparound supports, but essentially use that as a way to complement and supplement what um, uh, HUD's role is, which is to pay for rental assistance um, and to pay for um, the capital to help build um, more affordable housing. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll pause there, Aditi, but happy to answer more. Thanks, Richard. Um, Juicy, let's bring it back to the, to the state perspective. Um, how does, how is that translated for you all in California in terms of the problem that you saw that I think we've, we've all sort of identified, how you scoped those services, how you worked with stakeholders to, to get to where you are? Sure. Um, good afternoon, everyone. JC Cooper, I'm the state Medicaid director in California. Um, so we, uh, you know, really looked at uh, about a decade ago, we started really looking at data and we did a pilot. We definitely saw that 50% of our costs were coming from about 5% of our beneficiaries. Um, when we dug into the data even more, it really came down to people at institutional levels of care or at risk of institutional level of care, people experiencing homelessness, your most complex. Um, and almost all of them had some level of social need. Um, or uh, health-related social needs also with that intersection. So after five years of learning a lot, uh, we move forward um, with both the in lieu of services and the 1115 for what we call 14 community supports. Um, and it is a, essentially a suite of both housing services and, and or services to keep someone safely in their home um, with wraparound services. So I'll kind of break it down how we got there and then the process for um, stakeholder engagement. 
So I'll start on the housing and homelessness side. So we essentially looked at it and said, the ACA was amazing and expanded access to a large number of people. And some of them didn't actually have the full continuum of care. So someone experiencing homelessness goes into an emergency room multiple times, eventually gets admitted, and then can sit and languish in a hospital bed for sometimes six months. That's a really expensive bed. We could pay for a lot of housing, uh, not in a hospital bed. Um, so how do we make sure that we're building a full continuum for somebody, every person in our program, we feel like should have a full continuum of care available to them at any given point in time. Um, so what does that look like? So we have put forward what we call our housing bundle, um, very similar to what Gary was uh, describing, where it is housing navigation services, deposits, including first last month's rent, furnishing, et cetera, as well as those liaison services. Once someone's housed, you need to keep them housed. You want to make sure that they can stay successfully in that home. So those liaison services. Um, we also cover what's called uh, medical respite or what we call recuperative care. So somebody leaving a hospital, an emergency room, it also can, can be a community admission for someone maybe who's diagnosed with cancer, experiencing homelessness, putting them in through recuperative care. Um, and that's up to a 90 day period of time that they can stay, get medical care, of course, housing, food, everything. We also cover what's called short-term post-hospitalization. So that's six months period of time. You can also double up on that. You can go from recoup to short-term or short-term to coop. I can't remember what the piece is. And essentially get nine months of both clinical services, housing, food, et cetera. What we do in those programs is then we embedded what's called enhanced care management. So somebody who's linking them to permanent supportive housing, temporary housing, um, and or some housing pathway um, uh, as well, which is really, really critical. Um, and uh, so now we have the full continuum of services for somebody uh, to be able to successfully heal um, in an environment because somebody who's being discharged from a hospital with a wound, they're not going to be able to heal and recover on the street. Uh, and so it's critical that everybody has a place to, to heal. Um, and it is very clear, we've had an independent study in California, I know Arizona and other states have too. Um, it's not just medically appropriate, clearly, <laughs> um, but it's cost effective. We're actually demonstrating that even by investing in those additional housing services until somebody gets um, a voucher, gets into their home, um, it's costing less money overall for that individual and there's a demonstrated reduction of emergency room visits, inpatient stays, and or going into a skilled nursing facility. So the idea behind our community supports is providing somebody care at the lowest level possible and not putting someone in institutional levels of care or taking hospital beds when that is not what is needed for that individual. They just don't have a home to recover in. Um, and so we've really built out that continuum in a real way. We also then took another lens of, you know, a lot of the things in our 1915C waivers um, you have to eat, meet an institutional level of care. All of ours in California aren't statewide. Um, infrastructure, we didn't have that across the state of California. And so we essentially put almost all of our wrap services from our 1915C waivers um, into in lieu of services. So if you're familiar with Money Follows the Person, the federal program, uh, we also just essentially built that into an in lieu of service to be able to take someone from a skilled nursing facility or institutional level of care, transition them to our home or transition them to an assisted living environment and paying for that transition, including the home deposits, home modifications. Um, so we do do home modifications for anyone um, to be able to stay safely in their home or reside in their home as long as that's the best place for them to be. Um, and so those are included. But we also are looking across how do we continue to have somebody stay safely in their home and community if that's what they and their family are choosing. Um, and so we are covering um, things like um, caregiver respite is included. So for both children with complex medical conditions or older adults who need caregiver respite, sometimes that's really needed for them to reside safely in the community with their family um, or their circle um, instead of going into an institutional level of care. So covering that through our in lieu of services is allowing all of these various wrap services to be available um, and being available slightly earlier than they would be if you are narrowing it to a 1915C. Um, and so that's kind of our full kind of package. We also include um, asthma remediation in there as well. And so you'll see across those community supports, some of them are immediately in lieu of a higher intensity service, but some are preventing it as well. And I think that's the beauty with the new health related social needs. It doesn't always have to be an immediate replacement. You can demonstrate that it is a preventing a service for asthma remediation. For example, you're preventing a future emergency stay or inpatient stay. 
Um, and so I think that's one of the nice flexibilities that we have seen in regards to it, because that's really critical to do. And you can't always do that with the 1915C, right? So I think it gives that ability to be more upstream, which I think we're trying to do being more upstream in regards to providing interventions, because that's really where you can see the cost curve in a very real way, um, instead of waiting till somebody really gets sick and you pay that money uh, if you intervene earlier. Now, it's a sweet spot in regards to eligibility, and that's one of the biggest parts. So we did over two years of stakeholder engagement in California. It was brutal, <laughs> for the record, because um, you're bringing health world together with um, people who have not been in the health world, and then you're bringing community-based organizations who are like, Medicaid has too many rules, you want us to do too many things, uh, stop it. <laughs> um, and it took a really long time to build partnerships and to understand. So we built this all into our managed care plans. Um, and so we've already, we built that eligibility criteria. So we have eligibility criteria for each of these 14 community supports. And we vetted that over that period of time. It took a lot of, uh, you know, fine tuning. And, and what I would say is we're still fine tuning now that we're live, because you learn a lot once people are um, in it. Um, and uh, we also had to provide providers. I think the biggest thing though, is we didn't have this infrastructure across the entire state. Some had been being paid for by philanthropy or um, foundations or counties were putting up programs, um, but we in our 1115 put in a pretty sizable, what we call path, providing access and transforming health dollars, and that was to pay for actual infrastructure. So we are in the process of doing infrastructure build across the entire state of California um, to build up the providers, and we have actually increased every quarter over 40% of providers coming on to provide these services. Um, across the state of California. And we anticipate it will grow even more as our path dollars go out over the next few years. So essentially building statewide provider infrastructure so that people in certain counties, rural counties who would have never had access to these services before where we couldn't really do it as a full statewide benefit uh, will be able to flip from in lieu of to an actual full statewide benefit because we'll be able to demonstrate that anyone who needs it can actually have access to those services across the state. So that's the goal. Um, is uh, in the next few years to flip everything from in lieu of to an actual statewide benefit with the exception of things that have to be in 1115. We would still probably flip that to be a mandate instead of an option because uh, right now it's, it's optional. But even though it's optional, for example, that housing suite is in all 58 counties in the state of California. So we saw such a, a significant increase in need of demand um, that we've really been growing at a significant um, uh, rate. Um, but we've also, when we're working with our managed care plans, I think that's one of the biggest stakeholders is, you know, they're used to authorizing a surgery. <laughs> Guess what they're not used to authorizing? Housing services, supports, nutrition. Oh, we also cover uh, medically tailored meals and medically supportive foods uh, across the entire program. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to, to leave that one out. Um, and so that is new for them. And that has been probably one of our biggest pain points because as we've told our managed care plans, I don't want you to go and provide surgery. You contract with somebody who provides surgery. You contract with surgeons who do that. I don't want you to be the person who goes and provides these housing navigation services or doing this. You need a contract with community-based organizations and experts in the community who do this. Um, and so I think that has, this has been a, a long evolution of getting um, here. Uh, we learned a lot in the first a year and a half of being fully live um, across the state of California. And we're in the process of doing pretty big tweaks off of our lessons learned from the first 18 months. And so look forward to kind of digging in with our partners as we kind of take this to the next, next phase in California. Awesome. Thank you all so much. I, um, it's, uh, striking to me, we're at a health equity conference, right? It's in the title. Um, and so much of this work feels inherently rooted in the idea of advancing health equity, but I'm wondering if you all can reflect on what it means to bring explicitly an equity lens to this work. And that's a sort of open question. We're gonna transition now to more sort of popcorn fire style chat um, style. And I, I promise to incorporate some of your questions as well. To, to, to jump in, I mean, I, I think just uh, if I can get on a soapbox, I would say focusing on housing and the people who are unhoused or experiencing homelessness is the best way to address health equity um, the vast majority of people who live or are assisted by some form of HUD supports, whether it's people living in public housing or who have a housing voucher or homeless assistance, are uh, black, brown, or people of color. Um, a significant portion are, are indigenous. Um, 
if you think about homelessness just as a subset of that, and uh, you know, I think California is a great example of just how big the homelessness crisis is in California. Um, essentially, if you think about that um, as a subset of of Medi-Cal beneficiaries, right, or people experiencing homelessness, um, their entire healthcare system is homeless shelters, homeless outreach programs, soup kitchens. It's it's uh, so essentially like their safety net and their healthcare system is. Um, essentially the worst funded form of, of social services that exist in our, in our country. And so I, I think just thinking about um, what they have access to as opposed to um, what the uh, what other Medi-Cal beneficiaries have, um, just equalizing that means you need to figure out how to get people into a form of housing that they then can get plug into um, the kind of healthcare system. So I would say, you know, just even paying attention to housing status and the homelessness aspects of people who are um, uh, Medi- Medicare beneficiary or Medi- uh, Medicaid beneficiaries is a huge uh, kind of step forward in understanding health equity because it, I, I believe um, housing is probably one of the most important um, social determinants of health because where you live determines everything else. Um, your access to environmental quality, your access to education, employment opportunities, um, uh, your access to food. I'll just tag on to that. So in California in particular, um, I, I agree with you. We have 170,000 people experiencing homelessness in any given day in California, and that's probably understated. That's more than we have in SNFs, but look at all the infrastructure pe- per people in skilled nursing facilities. Like it's just, it's been long underfunded and paid attention to. And in addition to that, 39% of people experiencing homelessness in California are black. Only 7% of our population in California is black. So it's clearly disproportionately higher in regards to the population. So one of the things we did in California is we built in what we call a housing and homelessness incentive program. So we're actually incentivizing community-based organizations to target individuals who are uh, Black, African-American, and we have a very large um, Indigenous population as well. And uh, we have seen in the first year of all of the community supports provided across the state of California for housing and homelessness, over 45% are for individuals who are Black. So we are seeing um, a large in, in in the grand scheme of all those experiencing homelessness. So we are seeing targeted interventions, but it has to be targeted in order to actually um, do those pieces. We're also intentionally um, pr- uh, funding providers who can better meet the needs of individuals across the populations that have the highest disparities and making sure we're partnering with CBOs um, who can be trusted partners on the ground for us to actually bend that curve. It will take very intentional actions, in my opinion, to to be able to look at this. When it comes to food insecurity um, in Los Angeles, for example, 40% of people in Los Angeles are essentially food insecure. That's a huge number of people, and that's dominantly Latino population in Los Angeles. So um, the need here uh, of being able to really focus on in the intersection between health-related social needs and equity work to really break down disparities and um, be able to move the needle is, in my opinion, one of the most important pieces of health-related social needs work. Yeah. So uh, also to, to piggyback off of that, you know, the, the disproportionate uh, rate of folks who are homeless, who are also black and brown is similar in Massachusetts as well. So uh, one of the ways that we've really tried to incentivize folks uh, to uh, incentivize our health plans to really pay attention to trying to provide care for folks who are uh, homeless um, is by incorporating uh, the state of being homeless as a consideration and how much money um, a health plan receives to provide care for that individual. This is through something called risk adjustment, right? Where basically we uh, we predict how much money it will cost to provide care for an individual based on various characteristics. And if someone is more home is, is homeless, then the health plan will actually receive more dollars to pay for services for that individual. So just one one sort of financial lever that we're taking uh, to to call attention to uh, to that particular um, aspect. Um, for the flexible services program, that pilot program that I was talking about, uh, we have, uh, we've, we've been requiring our ACOs to, uh, to look at, the, um, to look at the, the racial and ethnic uh, breakdown of people who are receiving flexible services compared to a similar group of folks to see if, if they're actually uh, administering this program in a way that is equitable. And so this is something that the ACOs, they have to do analyses and send it to us. And then uh, recently, we've also rolled out a requirement where it's not just looking at uh, folks who access flexible services, but what what is the uh, what what's the breakdown um, by race and ethnicity of the actual outcomes, uh, so health outcomes uh, for people who are receiving uh, these social supports. The the final thing that I'll mention 
um, is, uh, you know, in order to do proper uh, slicing and dicing of the data by race, ethnicity, and other demographic fields, we need to have robust data for that. And uh, so this is a major area of focus for Massachusetts as authorized in our 1115 waiver. Um, in, through that waiver, in addition to the, the, the housing and nutrition supports that I just described, we also received approval for a $2 billion incentive program for our, for our acute care hospitals uh, called the Hospital Quality and Equity Initiative. Uh, and this is a, an effort to advance health equity among a bunch of different domains, but one of them is improving the collection of race, ethnicity, language, disability status, sexual orientation, and gender identity uh, demographic data. Um, and the goal here is to uh, actually put dollars into, the, into the, uh, the, the pockets of hospitals who are able to demonstrate and reach certain levels of data completeness. Um, and then we're also implementing a companion program for our accountable care organizations and our more traditional managed care organizations to also try to achieve higher rates of data completeness. So we're putting, uh, we're putting financial incentive dollars to uh, increase these rates, which we believe will allow us to better assess the disparities of, of folks who are um, engaging with uh, our, our mass health system. And I would just add, um, there are a lot of, there's a lot of intentional work that USDA is doing. One of the things that was just released um, over this last couple of months was a, an equity report um, and so the department established an equity commission that actually um, was tasked to really looking at equity throughout all of the USDA programs, which really led to all of the program areas coming up with a plan on how they're going to be addressing equity. Um, we look at policies, at practices, and guidance, since a lot of our programs are not delivered by the federal government, but by the state agencies, but the information that we're putting out there to support states in the operation of, for example, like the SNAP program. You know, we we get a lot of uh, com we have a lot of conversations with individuals who are in rural areas who really just want a grocery store, right? So, how are we going to help to increase access to those healthy food options? And so, how are we working with vendors and contractors and you know big corporations to see if they can go in and help and support some of those rural areas to give them better opportunities? I talked a little bit earlier about even the um, SNAP online purchasing which was an equity effort that was put forth to make sure that everyone had the same opportunity with purchasing and their purchasing power of, you know, food and nutritious, um, food and, food and nutritious, um, nutritious foods, I think is what I was trying to say. Um, and so uh, there is a lot of intentional work, I think, that's going on. We're doing a lot of uh, looking to see who who is on our programs, what populations are we missing from our programs? I think you both spoke to it already, but, you know, there is a lot of a large population of um, black indigenous brown folks who are not receiving SNAP benefits who are eligible, huge senior population who believe that they're taken from somebody else if they're actually on the program as well. And so it is more or less um, providing good guidance um, and information to the public, uh, to states as they implement these programs so that we can increase access and make sure that everyone has those same opportunities. Thank you all. We've got about 10, 15 minutes for questions. I want to, um, I have many more questions, but um, uh, wanted to take the opportunity if there are folks in the room that wanted to ask a question of our panelists. Um, we've got a mic up here, so just raise your hand and we'll get a mic to you. Please do introduce yourself um, as you're asking your question. Hi, it is on. Hi, Kate Johnson. I'm at the CMS Innovation Center. Thanks. This has been really a wonderful panel so far. I'm curious, um, it seems to me a key piece here is really around collaboration with community-based organizations. And I think, you know, you touched on sort of network adequacy or really like the challenges of MCOs in California in sort of figuring out how to procure these services. But I'm curious if you have perspective on sort of federal facilitators for that challenge. Interesting. Can you say a little bit more when you say federal facilitators for that challenge? Because I mean, there's a lot of challenges there. I just want to make sure I answer your question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, I guess I, I think we've heard a little bit in our accountable health communities model around sort of barriers for 
community-based organizations to sort of get federal funding from multiple sources and like braiding and blending those funding. So I guess I was curious from your perspectives, what you're hearing from your stakeholders. Yeah, no, um, braided funding sounds great until it's not. Um, At the end of the day, we are asking people to do significant braided funding. So even if you look, at least in California, um, there are different even state agencies who provide all of the services um, shown on this thing. Uh, and then at the federal level too. And um, and while we are really trying to bring everyone to the table, so we even did that housing and homelessness incentive program, for example. One of the things that we required our managed care plans do is they had to join their local continuum of care. Um, and uh, they had to, they were required to essentially have a seat at the table for any HUD um, decisions or any local housing and homelessness decisions so that it they were weaving themselves into the system. One thing we said is you don't get to just go make your own system um, because that won't work. Um, And we are trying to work across our state agencies and and you can see here federal agencies, but I still think that there's a lot of work. For example, we're only one piece of the large homelessness puzzle, um, to be honest with you. You know, I can't in Medicaid, I can't do it all. I can't pay for every piece along the continuum. And so um, it does require community-based organizations to work across. And we've been trying to do a lot of that we in California have a interagency um, housing and homelessness council where we work directly with our housing partners to figure out how can we start breaking down silos or advocate up to our federal partners around where we're seeing federal regs or pieces that are not allowing us to streamline. I think that as we more and more states get into the whole uh, like health related social needs, I think we'll see more movement there. But I do still think there are both federal and state um, policies that will need to change over the next decade to see this really come to what it can be. For example, we can pay for the housing navigation services, but if I can't get someone a voucher, I'm in a bad spot. And we actually had a case in California where somebody had been on short-term post hospitalization in recuperative care. They were sitting there. They could not get a voucher in time. Um, And so we essentially, the county is, we're lucky enough, Los Angeles has a very large, what's called Measure H. They pay for a lot of additional services and they paid with county funds only to keep them for the two months more longer they needed to get that voucher and then to get them into housing. Because we only pay for nine months, but the average time from identification to voucher or housing can be anywhere from eight months in some counties up to 18 months in certain counties because we have a huge housing access issue in California too, right? So this is where all of the players coming together is really, really critical and where braided funding can be really good because you have to use it within the restrictive change. You have to have really sophisticated community-based organizations to do this as well. And there's not a ton of those, to be honest with you. They're growing more and more. Um, but I think that's one of the biggest challenges is to this work, especially in states that are going into this new, it has been a huge learning curve. And then on top of that, telling them to build Medicaid, they, you know, they leave the room. I just quickly add to that because I that's such a great, I want to applaud that answer. That's such a fantastic answer. The fact that you even sort of like are, are trying to get uh, managed care to work with good teams of care, that's a huge step, right? And I think this is the problem with doing kind of cross-sector work is that we can sit in our own sector and talk with, you know, go all day using acronyms and understand the complexity of how our systems work and how, yes, you need to get authorization for that service in the healthcare space, right? And then I hear all the time from the healthcare folks, they're, they're like, why can't I just prescribe housing for my patient? Why can't I just like call up a number and get this person housing? And I'm like, you know, that's not how it works on your system. Like, why would you think the housing system works like that? We have a whole network ourselves of how you have to allocate the services. So, you know, you got to understand that we like, the homeless services system are organized into 386 different teams of care in the country. Um, that's just like the collaborative bodies that manage access to homeless systems. Um, vouchers, public housing is administered by 3,000 plus different public housing authorities across the country. If you understand that network and then create the incentives for healthcare system to be able to work with those existing agencies. So we at HUD have been working really closely with HHS to try to help connect the dots at the state and local level some more. We partnered with CMS and the Administration for Community Living and a few other HHS agencies to stand up a housing and services resource center. And it was meant to be a kind of like one-stop shopping webpage resource center webinars where you can get information on just how to even understand where those systems are and how do you begin to align um, things at the state and local level. We're also looking at how we can do some more hands-on assistance at the state level to connect the dots between states that are um, adopting um, housing-related services uh, and um, how to uh, blend and braid that with HUD programs. 
Uh, and um, we're also um, doing things like trying to issue guidance to our homeless continuums of care and public housing authorities. Like, here's how you can align your own policies for how you determine who gets access to housing assistance in what order with ways that um, Medicaid is aligning their resources. So one of the things we're working on, so uh, your homeless system has something called coordinated entry. Um, it's their way to sort of organize who gets priority for different types of housing and how do we match people to the right level of rental assistance um, that people need. And what we're trying to um, do is send a message to continuums of care. Your, your state may also be adopting these new Medicaid services. They are trying to determine who's medically appropriate to receive housing related services. How do you think about um, determining how you prioritize people for housing assistance? in ways that matches up or kind of coordinates with the way that people are deemed eligible for medically appropriate housing related supportive services. So we're doing things at the federal level to try to make our policies kind of mesh together with the way Medicaid policies work. There, there are a couple of threads that uh, JC and Richard both talked about that I'd like to, to follow up on. So um, when you were talking about your PATH program and how you're, you're hoping that that will actually increase the capacity of your CBO partners to, to become Medicaid sort of Providers, if just for lack of a better phrase, and then you were mentioning these resources that you're uh, uh, that you're making available. Like, I, I think one of the biggest issues is uh, these community-based organizations. Oftentimes, they're really small. Uh, they don't have expertise to know, like, what does it mean to be a HIPAA-compliant entity, right? Uh, when they're contracting, uh, when when they're trying to provide services, uh, when working with these health plans, they've never, they, they may not have actually any experience with operating in a model that other than a philanthropic model, right? So what does it mean to actually sign a contract with this large organization when they don't even have a lawyer on staff, right? So, so, what, is it, so what would it look like to provide resources to these community-based organizations around contracting, HIPAA compliance, data sharing, um, uh, working with IT systems uh, that, uh, that are more common in the healthcare space? This other, another topic uh, that I'm thinking about is, uh, it's sort of the flip side of, of what I just said, which is that a lot of medical providers know nothing about the housing world or the nutrition world or any of the other social services. I mean, they, they may have social workers or other uh, extended care team staff, but the, the leadership of these, uh, of these organizations may not know anything. So what would it look like, for example, to have monthly uh, webinars that HUD or USDA puts out for medical providers across the country to learn about the housing world and the nutrition world? You know, that, that would be so, I think, valuable um, and would help to really accelerate the momentum uh, towards better integration um, of, of these sectors. The, the last thing that I'll say is, uh, is around how, do, how does the medical world actually refer people to social service? Like, what's the actual modality, right? So a, a lot of times people will make a phone call. But more and more, there's electronic capabilities to be able to do this, and there are a number of these HRSN referral platforms that are out in in the wild. Um, this is like this is this is what happened with EHRs a while ago, and they're not interoperable. Like, what? How? How can we get them to all work together to be able to send messages from one platform so that all the other platforms uh, can also receive them, so that a, a CBO doesn't have to have like 10 separate logins for different uh, different platforms that different healthcare providers are, are parting with them. And so it, it's something that, that some states have tried to deal with by procuring a single statewide platform. That is one option. What does the interoperable option look like? And is there a role for the federal government to play to actually convene uh, th these players and actually uh, create a system that isn't gonna look like what EHRs look like today? Um, yeah, we, we have time for some more questions. Can folks hear me? Um, I, I, we, I think we have time for one more question. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm going to let Caroline decide because that seems like a tough job. Um, okay. This may be more of a comment based on what you were just saying about interoperability. So as a part of our SIM grant in Michigan, which, you know, we, we concluded a while back, our communities have been working on trying to create an inter, interoperability so that we've got closed loop referrals so that physicians can make those direct referrals into a human service agency and then hopefully get the data back that says that, yeah, we found them housing or yes, we got them the food that they needed. One of the barriers that we've encountered is that, especially with the merger of large hospital systems, the hospital systems themselves, as you say, are, are sort of buying these things that allow for resource referral 
but you're not getting the information back. And the only way this is going to work is if we can also nudge the hospital systems to work with community so that we're able then to really put those sort of those sorts of closal referral pieces together. And that is a barrier. And especially the more these guys merge with multiple hospitals in multiple states, it's it's becoming very difficult. And that that really I think comes speaks to a federal issue in terms of what can the federal government do to encourage the hospitals to to behave differently, maybe. That's helpful. I think maybe we have time for one more. Okay. All right, I'm being told we're at time now, um, but we're happy to stick around. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you again. A round of applause for our panelists. Um, we'll be here. Thank you.